Another individual, we've been doing a, a small series on the story of my life according to the Bible. But we've looked very briefly at Adam, uh, the story of his life according to the scripture. Then we looked secondly at Abraham and the story of his life according to the scripture. We also looked at Moses and his life, his uh, story according to the scriptures and the Bible. This morning, I'm going to look at another individual, patriarch, and we'll find him in Genesis in chapter number 30. It's the first mention of his name in the scripture, the word of God. And again, well, many of these, we could spend uh, time, um, weeks, days, uh, in some cases, possibly a month or more, uh, dealing with the details of their life. It's given in the Bible, but we're trying to just give an overview and a summary of their life and how God used them and kept and highlight some of the specific areas and their accomplishments, also some of their weaknesses, and uh, how God used them in spite of themselves. So let's look at Joseph this morning, the story of his life according to the scriptures. Notice what please in Genesis chapter number 30, and then we'll read in verse number 22, uh, down through 24. And God remembered Rachel, and God hearkened to her, and opened her womb, and she conceived and bare a son, and said, God hath taken away my reproach. And she called his name Joseph, and said, The Lord shall add to me another son. And I'm not going to go through and read more uh, scriptures this morning. I believe that this will be sufficient. Joseph is one of those, like Moses, that we have, and Abraham, we have volumes of scripture. The Bible's replete uh, with their story. And if we were to take time uh, to go through the scriptures and just read the verses associated with their name, uh, we would be here for hours just reading the Bible and the Word of God. As we consider uh, Joseph, he was one of the great uh, patriarchs of the scripture. God certainly had his hand on him. Uh, he has been used many times as a type of Christ because uh, the Bible refers on a couple of occasions, Joseph, the righteous one, or one that was righteous. And uh, we find that there's many parallel, uh, parallels in his life, uh, along with the Lord Jesus Christ as recorded in the New Testament. He was one of the sons of uh, Jacob, and he was also one of the tribes of Israel, of the 12 tribes. And I'm grateful for his life. I'm grateful how the Lord used him. You know, God has a way of making his servants. Some, uh, he has to put through deep valleys and trials. And you wonder about Joseph's life because Joseph seems to be very innocent and young when things begin to happen in his life. And humanly speaking, it, it would appear that things have turned for the worse. It's almost as if Joseph didn't stand a chance. There was a lot of tension in the family, a conflict between him and his brothers. He was loved by especially his father. And yet that caused feelings of emotions with jealousy and other issues. Uh, but you look at Joseph's life and you wonder uh, why in the world God will allow some of the things that happened in his life that happened, uh, especially when he was considered to be the righteous one. And he was such a young individual and the Bible records really no sin or transgression uh, in his life uh, to speak of. And that's why he's often used as a type of Christ. He was favored by his father. He gave him a special coat of many colors. Of course, we know that according to the scripture. And um, his brothers absolutely hated him and despised him as a result of it. And uh, Jacob, I believe, unintentionally uh, caused the conflict in the on the home and the family. And sometimes uh, that happens among men. You know, there's many homes where there's only one sibling. And so uh, they don't have to worry about partiality. And sometimes they don't understand the conflict with others. But it's because they haven't lived through that and gone through uh, those feelings and emotions and the conflict of others. Many times there's issues with adopted children because uh, I know uh, we have uh, some within the Ellis side of the family. Family and also on the grand side of the family, my mother and dad's family, uh, where there's been adoptions and there's that struggle to fit in between the uh, siblings and those that are have a DNA or blood lineage connected to the family. And oftentimes there's a lot of issues concerning that uh, where there's on, on both sides. Sometimes they turn out to be extremely dedicated, very skillful, very uh, educated to some degree and, and their life seems to prosper and do well. And then other times there's great conflict and they struggle to find their place within the family. As we consider the life of Joseph though, he is uh, the flesh and blood of his mother and dad who well, is going to be used of God. God's going to put him through certain depths and trials of his life in order to make him who he will become. Uh, he tells his family of a dream that God has given to him, and in fact, two dreams in totality. And we find that as a result of that, he, in essence, in his dreams, 
uh, his siblings and then also his mother and dad uh, bow to him and do obeisance to him. And of course, uh, that caused conflict, not just with his siblings, but even with his dad. And uh, Joseph is innocent. He's just sharing what uh, his dream was. And yet we find that because of the rage in, their, uh, brother, in his brother's life and in their heart, they absolutely despised him for it. And then one day uh, something would happen and take place. Uh, we would find that his dad would send him down to Shechem to check on his siblings. And of course, as he goes there, they connive against him and they take him and they strip him of his coat of many colors and they throw him into a pit. Somebody has re uh, rightly described the life of Joseph. And I guess you could really summarize everything in three words. And that is that Joseph went from a pit to the palace or from the pit to the prison to the palace. And it really is just uh, three words that summarize the life of uh, Joseph. And so his brothers hated him. They despised him. And I know this may be old hat to some of us that have studied the Bible. And you may say, well, this is really a simplistic thought. But the truth of the matter is, sometimes we overlook the simple things of the Bible. And those are the important things. Because as we look at them, God uses them to lay the foundation to deal in our lives and to do greater things for his glory and honor. That's why I believe that it's so important, and I say it often, and I hammer it home with among the ministry and our missionaries and even our leaders, that it's vitally important that we have doctrine. And I hear people sometimes say, well, doctrine is basic. Yes, it is basic, but the basic things are the foundation of our life. It's the foundation of the Bible. It's the foundation of our salvation, that Christ came to the world to save sinners, whom Paul said, I'm chief. And so God uses sometimes the simple things in our life to mold us and make us and break us and get us to where we need to be for his glory and honor. So he's thrown in the pit, and I'll not go through all the detail of that. I think most of us are familiar with the details of the scriptures. And as a result of that, he is eventually sold into Egypt, and we find that he lands in Potiphar's house, and um, through a series of events, uh, things happen in his life. Uh, Potiphar's wife had her eyes set on uh, Joseph and uh, she tried to get him to have a relationship with him and uh, he absolutely refused. And one day when no one else is in the palace and she calls him into the chamber and uh, he refuses to have a relationship with her, she reaches out he, and grabs hold of his coat. He flees from her and just as the Bible says to flee fornication. And so he flees out of her presence. She has his coat and Jezebel, if we could name her that, and that would probably be an understatement for Potiphar's wife. I believe she would make Jezebel blush. And uh, so she grabs his coat, lays on the bed, calls the servants and says that Jacob, or excuse me, Joseph had tried to molest her and lay with her. And so of course, uh, Potiphar had him thrown in prison. During that time, it's interesting, the correlation of the scripture, that he had two dreams that God would use uh, to, to invoke the jealousy and the rage in his brother and his family's life, but he also had two situations in prison, uh, dreams that God would give him concerning the butler and so forth. And as a result of all of that, God raised him up. He was taken out of the prison and taken into the palace. He was put over all of Egypt, and God used that for his glory and honor. I want to say to you this morning that God often uses trials and tribulations and troubles and valleys. When we're going through them, we have no idea of what's taking place and what God's doing in our lives. I look back many uh, times over the years of our life, and uh, there are times that we go through things. I had no idea what was taking place. I couldn't put my hands on it. I didn't have any insight to it. I was not able to discern and listen to me this morning. And I've taught on discernment. I've studied discernment over the years. And I believe that God gives us discernment. But God will not always allow us to discern everything in our lives. That's right. Somebody say amen right there. And the older men are saying amen because they know it to be true. Of the years of experience, there are things we go through in our life that sometimes God at the moment is not going to show us the cause or the purpose of those struggles because he has a greater plan, a bigger plan. If we knew right away, it's kind of like uh, someone said, I heard Dr. B.R. Lincoln say years ago, not that I heard him in person, but uh, by uh, cassette tape, that really dates things, doesn't it? And, uh, but he said, you know, I kind of feel like the preacher that said, if I find out where I'm supposed to die or where I'm going to die, I want to be sure I never go there. Well, 
uh, you know, it's kind of one of them things. If God were to show us what was taking place in our life, uh, we would probably try to bail out of it. But God didn't always show us all the details and the purpose and the cause and the reason of the things he allows to come into our life. But I can rest assured of this. Whatever the reason, whatever the purpose, whatever the cause, it's for our benefit and for God's glory. Amen. You know, in order to um, be balanced in life, there's a lot of catchphrase about balance today in our generation, has been for some time, especially as we get into the more and more into the digital age. It's amazing some of the things that um, are digitally being used uh, today that was just established or came into existence a, a couple, even three years ago, but now is already becoming obsolete. And it's very difficult for ministries to stay up with it because you get one thing established and before you get established, the world's move on to something else. It's very challenging. It can get very frustrating sometimes uh, trying to stay up with it. But God has a divine purpose and God has a divine plan. I wonder where we preachers would be if God were to somehow just roll back the curtain of the future, even the next decade for us, and show us all that is laying just in the immediate future for us. It's very challenging for preachers now to stay focused on the ministry. We get pulled from right to left and forward to backward and upward and downward, if I could put it that way. And it's very challenging to try to just stay focused and stay right down the center. And uh, I'm talking about doctrine and all of that. I believe we're established in the, those areas. Uh, those of us that are here, and no doubt those that are listening or that wouldn't be listening this morning. Uh, but I'm not talking about balance and ministry as, and doctrine and our position on the Bible. I'm not talking about just balance and ministry in general. I mean, what does a preacher do? Um, I was in a church last night, and they haven't even started back their Sunday evening services yet from the COVID. And... Uh, it's a church made up of mostly older people. And I'm not slamming older people, but many of them are afraid to come back to church because of the COVID and the virus. And so what's a preacher to do? And I know, and even so many people don't like you so much knocking on their doors now because of the virus and the impact it's had. And so a lot of our culture and our indoctrination, our philosophies and our methods of ministry are being challenged today because of just one plague that God allowed to hit our nation and the nations of the world. And many nations are still closed down, but God does this that he may push us forward and develop us and mold character in our life. Well, can I just say this, that God used Joseph's life in a tremendous way. God allowed him to exemplify great wisdom. Uh, he, uh, somebody said, well, he never got discouraged. Well, I can't say that he never got discouraged. The Bible didn't record anything specifically that I know of. Uh, but I can't say that he didn't get discouraged. God didn't tell us one way or the other. And to say that, we're reading between the lines. And I know uh, sometimes we can summarize and make accurate statements based upon different things in the Bible. But listen to me this morning. And I'm very careful to say this because of a racially charged generation we live in. And um, I'm, I'm down the line. I know exactly where I stand concerning the races. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Red, yellow, black, or white. They're all uh, able to be saved if they'll come to Christ in the saving knowledge of him, his Amen. death, burial, and resurrection, and his shed blood. Amen. So I'm not speaking of that race. Um, but, and you have to look at it from the perspective of the day, of the day we're living. I mean, you can't say anything without being uh, risking being labeled a racist. It's pathetic. In the day and age we live. And I said it and it's recorded. But I want to say this this morning. There is some gray in the Bible. Everything is not exactly black and white. Uh, there are some things we can conclude based upon what God's told us in the scripture. Um, you know, there are some things. Uh, let me give you one of them. And I'm probably going to offend somebody. I don't guess here, but maybe somebody online. Uh, the Bible doesn't say thou shalt not smoke. But I don't believe we're all to smoke. I don't believe we can uh, be completely right with God and abuse our body or temple. And uh, I want to say this this morning. I fit in this category. I believe that we preach against uh, men with long hair, women in short skirts and low tops. And we preach against drinking and alcohol and drugs and hair and, and dedication, commitment. And we ought to preach those things. I say, amen, swing from the chandelier, run the aisles, wave the hanky. We ought to preach those things. Yeah, amen. But obesity is another uh, thing that just as bad as anything yeah. else. A lying tongue. And Baptists have a tendency to have a lying tongue these days. 
and deception and deceit. And so there's so many things today that we uh, we consider that we just don't hear preached as much anymore. Right. Now, don't get me wrong. Again, I believe in all those things I said a moment ago. I preach them. It's not a steady diet, but I believe it ought to be preached. Right. Well, amen, Terry. Amen. All right. I'm for it 100%. But there are other things that we seem to pass right over the top of. Right. So as we consider the life of Joseph, you say, how'd you get all that out of his life? It's in there somewhere in the fine print, I'll promise you. <laughs> um, you know, the truth of the matter is God just allows things to happen. And you know what? Um, can I just put it this way? And I'm not, I don't have time to go through the outline. I'll get started preaching. Brother Elvis Emerson used to put it this way. He said, there's three things that independent fundamentalists absolutely drives them nuts. And the number one thing, and this is the only one I'll plug in here and I'll need to wrap this up and be done. But he said, the number one thing that bothers independent fundamentalists, and you probably heard him say it on several times, Brother Gene, probably Brother Charles. He said, the number one thing of the three that drives independent fundamental Baptists nuts is things that they cannot control and dictate. Right. Yeah. If we can't control it, we can't change it, and we can't move it immediately, it drives us nuts. There are just some things God's, God allows to come into our life. It don't matter what we do or what our opinion is or what our feelings are, or what our emotions are, we can't change them. Right. Right. It takes right. God. Amen. And what a day it was when I came to the conclusion that, you know, there's just some things I don't have any control over. Right. God just has to do it. And I say this, and I say it in all due respect uh, for anyone that may have a divorce in their life against like obesity. I put myself in that category. Uh, we need to be careful in those areas. But I'm just going to say this. Divorce. God's not for it. The Bible says God's against it. And I'm not going to get into the battle this morning on which side you're on and the justification or the uh, the judgment of it this morning. Uh, you know why I stood, I stand on this. I've mentioned on many occasions, but you know, there are just some things in life we just can't control. Right. You can't control the lifestyle of a spouse. You can't control the outcome of a child. You can't control, there's just some things in our life, it don't matter how hard we try and how righteous our motive and our heart, there's just some things in life we can't control. Joseph found out there are just some things in life you just can't control. And you just have to leave it Amen. in the hand of God Amen. and for his will to be accomplished. Well, I'm going to have to close there this morning. My time is gone. I've still got several paragraphs and statements, but I'm going to try to keep to one a day, as I said in the beginning. But I just want to say this this morning. May we learn from Joseph. What we can control and what we can change, let's do it for God's glory and do it for uh, his honor. Do it the best we can. But what we can't control, just leave it in the hands of God. Amen. Quit fretting about it. Quit worrying yourself sick. Just let go and let God, as the old preacher said. Well, it may be simple this morning, but it's true. Amen. And there's a lot of things we can learn from each of these patriarchs' lives and so today, Joseph, the story of my life, according to the Bible. We've got many more ahead, so let's have a song this morning, and we'll go from there. Our song leader had to slip out to unload.